for real now. All right, so I've got the full screen on now. It's going to, it's all good. All right, so as we saw in the film, in the, in the Rock Pocket Mouse film, the tiny Rock Pocket Mouse weighs just 15 grams, about as much as a handful of paper clips, and a typical Rock Pocket Mouse is just, just tiny. It's just a little guy. Um, we looked at the importance or what's so special about these in the last lab that we did on the molecular genetics aspect of it and and specifically looking at the mutations that happened at each of those different parts of the protein of the MC1R protein. So if we were to investigate the adaptive value of different different coat colors in the rock pocket mice it's an example of how scientists are attempting to connect genotype remember the genotype is the it's the alleles that are present with the phenotype which is the physical description for fitness related traits remember what fitness means yeah so what okay so what is it then no i remember the no. so we we talked about remember we talked about relative fitness when we talked about the biology of skin color right when we first yeah. examined this mc1r gene um, with relation to human skin color so there was a selective advantage or there was a the positive fitness there was a, some individuals were more fit for the environment were a better fit for the environment because of their skin tone right and a darker skin tone closer to the equator meant that that individual was able to protect their blood level full or the folate levels in their blood right the melanin the eumelanin protected the folate levels in the blood closer to the equator the further away from the equator you got a lighter skin tone was needed to allow more UV light in to produce more vitamin D. So that was a selective advantage, which increased those individuals' fitness north of the equator. So we're looking at making that connection not in humans, but in other organisms. And that's what Dr. Nachman has been trying to do with his research. So examples of other fitness-related traits that research are the ones we talked about with skin color, the resistance to pesticide, uh, the pesticide warfarin in rats, tolerance to heavy metals in plants, and antibiotic resistance in, in bacteria. So with this activity, you're going to need a calculator. That's fine, you can share. You can use your calculator on your computer, absolutely. Okay. We've already watched the film, right? So we, we don't need to watch the film again. But what we are going to do is look at these introduction questions as part of the procedure. So what was the specific trait that researchers studied in that investigation? Color of their coat. Right, the coat fur color of these rock pocket mice. Okay, so it was their coat color. Tressie. Welcome. We just finished. We just finished up with the corrections for the previous, the most molecular genetics, yeah. and now we're moving on to the Hardy Weinberg. So you haven't really missed too much. We're just introducing it right now. Okay. So if we're looking at coat color, what were the two variations of it? Dark and light. Dark and light, right? So how does the trait affect the survival of the mice in different environments? Right, so depending on the substrate, depending on the ground color, the light would be increase their fitness and the dark would increase their fitness or vice versa, okay? The next question is, might be a little bit tougher. Right, so the question specifically is, how does the trait affect the survival of the mice in different environments? So you could be more specific and say that a light-colored mouse on a light-colored substrate is harder for predators to see, and a dark-colored mouse on a light-colored substrate is easy for predators to see. Or you could switch it around and talk about the dark-colored substrate.
markers really that. So the next question is, is a little tougher. What's the genetic basis for that trait? Okay, the MC1R is the gene. Okay, so the MC1R gene, what is its function? So what's the basis? What's its function? It controls the pigmentation. It controls pigmentation. Specifically, it controls the amount of melanin, melanin that being either eumelanin or phaeomelanin. Awesome. So it controls the amount of eumelanin or phaeomelanin that's produced. Really, it controls the melanin, the pigmentation. All right, before we get going any further on this, we do have to go back a little bit when, to our evolution unit when we were talking about the Hardy-Weinberg theorem. <clears throat> and remember that the Hardy-Weinberg theorem were five principles that are set in place that state evolution will not occur if all of these five principles are met. So, according to Hardy-Weinberg theorem, a population is in equilibrium, meaning it's not changing, when all of the following conditions are true. The population is very large and well mixed. There is no migration. There's no mutation. Mating is random. And there's no natural selection. Okay, so we know that in nature, this does not occur. All five of these conditions are not met in nature. Right? So when we talked about how this relates to evolution, we then looked at these being the mechanisms of evolution. Right? And then looked at specific examples of each of those. And we'll talk more about that again next week when we review. We'll go back to that and talk about, well, what are those specifics? All we're going to be looking at now is, okay, how do we tell that evolution is occurring using information based on frequency of alleles, and information based on those frequency of alleles and the phenotypes in that population. So to determine whether a population's gene pool is changing, we need to be able to calculate what we refer to as allelic frequencies. So the frequency of the big A, the frequency of the little a, or the frequency of big A, big A, the homozygous dominant, or the frequency of big A, little a, the heterozygous, or and the frequency of little a, little a, or or what we call homozygous recessive. So each individual has one of those three genotypes. If the population's in equilibrium, the overall number of dominant A alleles <clears throat> and recessive A alleles in the gene pool are going to remain constant. That's if the population is in equilibrium, if it's not changing. As will the popular, the proportion, sorry, of the population with each of the genotypes. Those will not change either. either. They'll remain constant. Okay, if the frequencies or the genotype frequencies change over time, then evolution is occurring. Then we know that evolution is happening. So this is another proof that evolution happens in a population or is occurring in a population. Now, does this mean that we're going to see speciation? No. Because remember that evolution is the change in the frequencies of alleles in a population. That's what evolution is. Okay, it's the change in those organisms over time. So what we're going to be looking at is to find evidence of that using this Hardy-Weinberg theorem. So two equations are going to be used. Okay? So those two equations that are used are P plus Q is equal to 1. And P squared plus 2PQ plus q squared is equal to 1. Do you guys remember this one? Is that that no. stupid question? Yeah, that was the bonus question. <laughs> that was the bonus question on that one test, right? And that on the evolutionary quiz that we had. 
So I threw that bonus question on there that had to do with this. You needed to know this formula in order to answer that, okay? So that's what we're going to be learning about here. So what the first equation is telling us is that if there are only two alleles for a gene, one dominant and one recessive, then 100% of the alleles are either dominant, P, or recessive, Q. So P itself is equal to the frequency of the dominant allele. Q is equal to the frequency of the recessive allele. So make sure you're writing those, those down. P is equal to the frequency of the dominant allele, and Q is equal to the frequency of the recessive allele. The second equation, so that P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equal to 1, that equation says that 100% of the individuals in a population will have one of the three genotypes, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. So what we're going to do is see how these <coughs> variables that we have up here, P and Q, relate to those genotypes, big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. So if the P represents the frequency of the dominant allele, then the frequency of the genotype for the homozygous individual is equal to P times P, which is equal to P squared. Does that make sense? Yes. If P represents the frequency of the dominant allele, then P times P is P squared. That's all P squared is. So that's what P squared represents, is the frequency of big A, big A in that population. P squared is big A, big A? P squared is big, it's the homozygous dominant, absolutely. Now, we may use different letters depending on the trait, the, depending on the character, sorry, that we're looking at, okay? So we, it's not always gonna be big A, big A, but it is always gonna be P and Q. But the P squared is always gonna be Right. Q squared is always going to be homozygous recessive because Q is equal to the frequency of the recessive allele. And the frequency of the recessive allele is Q times Q, which is the same as Q squared. Now, for the heterozygotes, we have to take into account that either the mother or the father can contribute the dominant and the recessive alleles. So we can think of it as allowing for both genotypes, big A, little a, and little a, big A. So we have to calculate the frequency of heterozygous as 2PQ. That's why we have the Q in front of it. Because there's two options for it. So that's the frequency of our heterozygotes. 2 times P times Q. Logic, makes sense logically? If you can follow that, you're halfway there. We're, we're good. In the rock pocket mice then, several genes code for the fur color. It's not as simple as, as we make it out to be. So that's why there's a range of very dark to very light and same thing with skin color. We have multiple alleles that are, that are taking place in order to influence the, the shade Okay, so for this we're gonna just simplify it. The allele for dark color for big D is dominant to the allele for light color for little d. So in this scenario, individual rock pocket mice can have one of three genotypes and one of two phenotypes, as we can see in this table. They can either be homozygous dominant, big D, big D, and dark. They can be heterozygous, big D, little d, and dark. Or they can be homozygous recessive, little d, little d, and light. Simple? Yeah, good. 
So if we're going to apply the Hardy-Weinberg theorem and these variables to what we know for the alleles, for the genotypes, we know that P is the frequency of the dominant allele, big D. Q is the frequency of the recessive allele, little d. P squared, the frequency of big D, big D. 2PQ, the heterozygous big D, little d. And Q squared, homozygous recessive, little d, little d. Now, I guess before we get going or, or move further on, what does frequency mean? What does that term mean? Okay, the amount of times that it could show up in in a population, right? So in a population. So it would be the number of those individuals divided by the total number of individuals in that population, right? So the frequency of... Um, ah, what's a good example? Yeah the, fr yeah, the frequency of waves. How many times does that wave pass that point, right? Or the frequency of Connor McDavid, I guess, toe-dragging and beating Morgan Riley every time he's on the ice. Okay, now Morgan's ankle was broken before that, so he didn't break it during that. He broke it after or before that, so he was playing on a broken one. He didn't get it broken then. I think the best way to do this is to work through this sample problem together because it, it is, by doing it, we're going to be able to put this into practice. Um, so rather than me writing this up on the board, you have it in front of you. I want you to write these out while we're going through the problem though, okay? Because if you just stare at it, it's not the same. So flip it however you use to write with your ink. Here's the hypothetical population. We have 100 rock pocket mice. Of those 100, 81 individuals have light sandy colored fur. What genotype is that? Uh, little d, little d. Little d, little d, awesome. Their genotype is little d, little d, it tells us that. Good, I'm glad you guys didn't read it. Okay, the other 19 individuals are dark colored and have either big D, big D, or big D, little d. Okay, so of those three genotypes, of those two numbers that we have, which one of those can we use to find either P or Q? Just P or Q, because we want to use that first formula, P plus Q is equal to one. Let me rephrase this. What variable does little d, little d stand for? Q. Is it Q or? Q squared. Q squared. Q squared. So we could say that Q squared is equal to 81. Is that correct? So from that 81% or that 81, could we find Q? Yeah. Absolutely. We could take the square root of both sides, I get rid of Q squared and I have Q is equal to 9. Because Grace is so super awesome smart, she doesn't need her calculator. That's why we memorize, that's why we memorize stuff. So we can just rattle it off. Awesome. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to use that value, that variable, to solve for P. So if P plus 9 is equal to 1, what's P equal to? Oh, it's not 9, sorry. Oh my god. How did we screw this up? It's not 81, it's 0.81. Remember, it's the frequency of those individuals divided by the total population. So it's divided by 100. So you get 
that mistake that I just made is the same mistake you are all going to make when you get it wrong. You did it on purpose. No. Absolutely not. But I'll take it. I didn't, but I do do it all the time. Okay. So remember, and that's why I brought up the frequency. What is frequency? So remember that you divide that, the frequencies, the number of individuals with that trait by the total number of individuals in that population. So thankfully we have a built-in eraser on these awesome pens. And I have it. So here's the question that I have for you. How come I couldn't just take 19 to find the frequency of big D? Because you have the, you have the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous one. And the heterozygous. Okay. So remember when we were doing our pedigrees and we were looking for how do we determine what's going to be the dominant or recessive, if it's a dominant or a recessive trait? We're looking for individuals, right? Two individuals, we're looking for two similarities. In this case, we're looking for something similar. We're looking for the little d, little d, the homozygous recessive, and that gives us, because there's only one option for it, right? For those two, there's in that population. That's all there's going to be. Okay, so this gives us that. Now we calculate the frequency of, we've got big P, we've got Q, now we want to calculate the frequency of 2PQ. We simply plug the values in. 2PQ is equal to 0 0.1 times 0 0.9 times 2. And that's equal to 0 0.18. saying that only one... Um, because it says 19 of them are dark. And that's saying 0 0.18 or heterozygous. So is that saying only one of them is dark? Right. This one's saying that 18%, 9%, 90%. and 1%. Right? Or 10%. 90%, sorry. So then are we saying that like P squared... Is this is like 2, 1.8. Yeah. So P squared is... So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So our p squared value is equal to 0 0.1 squared. How else can I find that value? Other than by squaring p. I could take p squared plus 2pq plus q squared is equal to 1. I just plug the values in that I had is equal to 1 minus 2 times P times Q 1 minus 0 0.18 sorry minus my Q squared value which was 81 divided by 100 0 0.81 and that's going to give me my P squared value and what does that equal? Yeah, there you go. And there we go. Okay, so then that's all the math that we have to do. Now we just go on to answer the questions. If there's 12 rock pocket mice with the dark colored fur and four with light colored fur in a population, what's the value of Q? Okay, so we've got that one. Now we're going on to questions. No more examples. What do I have to do first here? Kev's looking at me like, huh? Remember, remember what I remember what I talked about when we said we're going to work through these genetic problems. What should we do? Right on, 
Okay, so we write out the givens, or we can, what we can do is we can put the alleles over top of the question, right? So let's do that. So I've got 12 rock pocket mice with dark colored fur. So that's big D, big D, or big D, little d. I've got four with light colored fur, little d, little d. In the population, what's the value of Q? What's Q squared equal to? 81 or over 100. 81? Over 100. No, we've got 12 rock pocket mice in a dark, with dark colored fur oh, and four not, it's always not in a population. Four. The example we did? It's going to be four. Right. What do I divide that by? What's the total population? Square 16. 16. Awesome. What's 4 divided by 16? 1 quarter, which is 0 0.25, right? 0 0.25. So Q would be equal to the square root of 0 0.25. 0 is it 0 0.5 or 0 0.4? 0 0.5. I, can't, I always mess this 0 .5. up. Is it 0 0.5? I know what I want to say, and usually what I want to say comes up wrong sometimes. Pretty simple, yeah? yeah. Kind of. It can, it can be, here's, again, here's the tricky. If you forget that the frequency of it is the number of individuals divided by the total population. Now, the frequency of P in a population is 60% or 0 0.6. What's the frequency of Q? Why is it zero? Why is it 0.4? Right, p plus q equals one. So q is equal to one minus 0 0.6, and that's equal to 0 0.4. The last example we go through. Where are we at for time? In a population of a thousand rock pocket mice, 360 have dark colored fur, big D, big D, or big D, little d. The others have light colored fur, little d, little d. If the population's at equilibrium, what percentage of mice in the population are homozygous dominant dark colored mice? Huh? So there's a thousand altogether. There's a thousand altogether. And we're trying to find homozygous dominant. So we're trying to find big D, big D. Right. So we have to 360 divided by. Oh, okay. You're going to do something with 360. But, yeah. but how many light colored ones do we have? 640. S 640, right? 1,000. Minus 360 is 640. So that gives us a number of little d, little d, so homozygous recessive individuals in that population. Can we use that to calculate the frequency of Q? Yes. Absolutely, because we know that Q squared, in this case, is equal to 640 divided by 1,000, or in this case, 0.64, right? So Q is equal to the square root of 0 0.64. P would be equal to 1 minus 0 0.8. Does everyone understand how I got the P is equal to 1 minus 0 0.8? Can you just rearrange the equation? Right. It's, this, is, this comes from my P plus Q is equal to 1. So P is 0 0.2. What's the frequency of the homozygous? That's what we're looking for, dominant? Or I can just simple, really keep it simple and square 0.2. And that's equal to 0 0.04. 0 0.04. It's the square root that I always 
messed up. I get the square root and the squared confused. And that's my answer. So the frequency P squared is, is homozygous dominant, right. 2PQ is the other one. Okay. So, <laughs> the next part I'm going to let you guys go on. Okay, so you guys have all the information that you need now for this. Okay. You don't need any more help from me. Well, I'll help you with it, but... You don't need any more. It's just up to you guys to work through this one. All right, good luck. <laughs>